All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we're gonna get started here in just a sec. Feel free to come on in if you're in the hallway. Um, but this is the session for the future of broadcast animation and motion graphics. Indeed. So, BK, I'll let you introduce yourself okay. and All right. kick this thing off. All right, good. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you feeling? How's New Orleans treating you? Anybody is, is tired? 9 a.m. session. 9 a.m. session. <laughs> Appreciate you all being here. Um, so I am Bernd, or, or more commonly known as BK, so please call me BK. I am the industry manager for broadcast and live events. So I've been kind of in the broadcast graphic space for the past 19, 20 years. Um, yeah. yeah, and I'm Andy Blondin. I'm the director of product management for broadcasting. So I look after all the tools that you're going to see today. We're going to give you a sneak peek into you know, where we're at, current state of things in terms of how people are using Unreal in broadcast today, and then some of the features that we're working on for the future. Um, but myself, I spent uh, seven years at Fox Sports being a motion graphics design director there. So I've worked on every major sport. If you've ever been in a sports bar, you've probably seen my work or my team's work. I know many of the people here in the room uh, as well work on those same kinds of events. So obviously Unreal has come into broadcasting you know, uh, seven, eight years ago. It's been a long time. And people are using it very effectively uh, throughout many different areas. So we'll show them some. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. So like Andy says, you for sure have seen Unreal at work. Uh, a lot of it in live sports broadcast. It could be, you know, AR graphics. Uh, we've seen from from like the top high-end productions like the Super Bowl. We've also seen it more from like brand activations. You've seen here from the Chipotle ad, which uh, kind of went a little viral. Uh, it's the same technology as Unreal running under the hood here. With, uh, with some really cool partners that uh, enhance it. Um, virtual sets, of course, green screens, uh, still very much in use. A lot of the uh, broadcasters were, in a way, hesitant to go into green screen and, and virtual uh, until they reached or until we had like a really high fidelity as they saw coming with Unreal Engine. Uh, this is from the BBC showing how they, they enhanced their Tokyo uh, and also their Be Beijing Olympics coverage. They, this was a little bit also, of course, a consequence of the pandemic uh, where you know, they couldn't actually travel, or it was, at least it was really, really hard. Uh, they used Unreal as a tool of how could they bring the you know, atmosphere of Tokyo to the audience, even if they weren't actually there. We see it a lot used to do like explainers. Um, these could be broadcasted live, but they could also be something that is kind of recorded and, and, and you know, they're, they're, uh, they're live to tape essentially. Uh, but where Unreal comes in with a totally, you know, next generation fidelity that allows them to explain these, these concepts, like, like we see from the Weather Channel here, uh, really hard to explain what is happening in this kind of, what is it called? A fire NATO? Yeah, fire NATO. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real thing, apparently, and, and this is how it works. So, so we see a lot of, of, uh, of people out there that are, you know, they're getting to, to Unreal because it can actually offer that type of fidelity. Uh, we also have a quick clip here. Uh, or is it just a picture? It'll play once you click. Okay. But you can uh, intro A quick it. clip here, quite recently. Um, we did a spotlight on it if you're curious about more information about, of it. Uh, we also have other partners here that were involved in actually making this happen. This is from Fox Sports that very recently launched a brand new studio. Uh, it's super fascinating because it kind of paves new ground for how to deploy virtual technology, uh, it's like a hybrid of what you've seen maybe more of here, virtual production used within film. And here you see how they're deploying it in a multi-camera live broadcast scenario for the NFL Sunday football show. Yeah, in fact, we at Fox Sports, we like 
to differentiate ourselves by being bold, taking risks. The biggest switch from green screen to LED is the live component. The director needs to actually see the shot they're about to take. And if one camera is rendering a specific angle onto the LED, well then another camera is not. So that's where this ghost frame technology was sort of the secret sauce to making a live broadcast happen. 16 Unreal Engines render four cameras real time. Seven Unreal Engines on top of that, just doing AR. That has never been done before. In fact, um, Giraffic worked on that, who's here, so kudos to them. If you're interested in more of the behind the scenes detail, reach out to Nate and his team can definitely kind of give you the lowdown. Uh, as well, we have more of the field guides too that we're gonna uh, be able to give out. So definitely a very cutting edge project in terms of you know technologically one of the most advanced things I've seen in a long time in broadcasting, so. So I think it's in a way a little bit fair to say that Unreal has in some ways set a new standard for what you can do when it comes to mixed reality or virtual sets AR. Um, it's a lot of it thanks to really good partnerships that we've had for many years and we're continuing to, to, to gain new partners that are leveraging the power of Unreal. I think we also have found that this is catering to a kind of a very specific need. Uh, and it's, in a way, it's the, the shiniest. It's really awesome, it's really cool, and we love it. But it's also not maybe the largest need they have in terms of real-time graphic. And there is a desire from a lot of broadcasters to, to adopt Unreal for more of their needs. Uh, so I think we're also try this out ourselves. We're, we're in a way also broadcasters. We have you know, our games, Fortnite and Rocket League and others, uh, and we worked a lot with the Rocket League team to see how does it actually feel to use our products and particularly looking at new ways of using Unreal Engine for more of their graphic needs. So some of the partners we work with are up here. This is not an exhaustive list. This is some of the tech partners uh, that fill in some gaps. Uh, we'll touch more on, on kind of what's coming down the road, but probably all of you kind of know that we, we, we focus a lot on being a platform and a render technology, but we don't really solve a lot of the workflow needs within live broadcasting or, or live events. And this is where a lot of our partners come in and add tremendous value. Uh, so our go-to-market, if you will, has a lot been through these partners where they are completing the, the solutions. Uh, but as we're continuing to invest in the core technology, we are seeing that it's opening up opportunities for partners to provide solutions. It could be bespoke solutions, it could be general solutions, at a much lower cost with a lower investment. So this is the question me and Andy have been like pounding our head on the wall saying, well, where do we go now? I mean, in a way, everybody is either using Unreal or wants to use Unreal for the really high end productions. Uh, but what's next? So instead of us just kind of you know, pretending we know everything, Yeah, we actually go out and ask people. Uh, so we do some, some surveys uh, asking, you know, what would you like? Uh, what do you do? We do see that in terms of usage of real-time graphic technology, this kind of, the, the applications we're seeing today with like AR and virtual studios is a very small portion of their needs. If we add in the studios, as we saw the example from, from Fox Sports, okay, it's a little bit bigger. But it is a really big part of it that deals with overlay graphics, visualizations of data, animations, 3D you know, motion graphic packages. Yep. Yep. A lot of time and resources are spent in this area. 
So that gives me a great handover to Andy to say, what are you going to do about that? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's been my task, is to figure this out. And so part of this, we started about a year ago or more working with the Rocket League team. And kind of at Epic, we eat our own dog food. We try to do projects. And so um, we also work with the community. We talk with the different uh, broadcasters. And we did a broadcaster summit about a year ago this time, and 30 of the largest you know, global broadcasters. And we asked them, are you interested in doing 3D motion graphics with Unreal? And as you can see, 65% of them said yes. 20% of them have already started doing it. Um, but that's a pretty clear path that most uh, TV networks around the world are wanting to do this kind of stuff. So we started working with our Rocket League team and uh, trying to prove this out. How do we build an animation package for an eSports that runs um, all the time and be able to treat it like it's a, a live show. So we learned a lot during this process. I'm gonna play a little bit of the sizzle reel here um, and then I'll, I'll speak more to the project. So yeah, some of the goals of that for us were to work with Rocket League, create in both in tandem a uh, actual broadcast, but then turn this into a sample that you can download. So many of you have probably already seen this is a downloadable sample that you can uh, pull in from the marketplace. We worked with Capacity Studios, that is an amazing motion graphics company uh, that helped us kind of build this hype chamber environment. It's fully customizable, treated just like it's a major league sport where we can swap the teams. Uh, Warren on my team did an amazing job as a tech artist, kind of rigging things up with blueprints to be able to swap all the items dynamically. Um, but the goal was to really replace all that offline rendering. Um, Rocket League was you know, rendering every matchup, every clip, and it was just uh, a workflow nightmare for them. So we wanted to get them out of that. Uh, so being able to swap all the clips, being able to do ray tracing at 60 FPS was some of the goals. And then we wanted this to be live controllable. So we hooked it up to and you'll see some of the features of our remote control API so that you can expose properties, change things live on the fly. And so we learned a lot during that process. And one of the things we learned was that we couldn't do 2D graphics <laughs> effectively. And so we asked the broadcasters back at the summit last year as well, you know, are you interested in doing 2D motion graphics? So a large majority of the on-air presence of TV networks is, is done in this area. So you can see 81% of them said yes, and 5% were trying, but you know, not succeeding too well at this point. So that leads me to a little bit where I want to spend the rest of the time today talking about is we started a project called Project Avalanche. And Avalanche is a set of tools that's designed for 2D and 3D motion graphics. This is going to be a little sneak peek into the future. This is not something that's out yet. So Everything's kind of subject to change at this point. It's very experimental. But we're proving out uh, a lot of the workflows uh, right now internally. So I'm going to play a few videos and talk over them. And then I want to make sure we leave some time for Q&A here at the end. But so Project Avalanche, I'll go ahead and play the video here. Um, see if it's going. There we go. Okay, so Project Avalanche is uh, it's a it's a new tool inside the engine that allows you to do 2D uh, and 3D motion graphics in the same space. Sorry about that, I'm getting a little judder on the video, but um, you can see that there's a new layout for doing uh, motion graphics, and you can see that uh, it essentially is a souped-up blueprint editor that gives you access to all the tools in one place. So we've done a bunch of work on the World Outliner. One of the complications that we had is, you know, with the world outliner inside of Unreal, it's like everything's ordered alphabetically. It's hard to nest things and group things. It's hard to control some of those items. And so we've built a, uh, we've spent a bunch of time on that. 
You can also see at the, um, at the bottom of the screen, we'll get into is more the animation section here, but in the world outliner, you can now kind of nest and group items however you want. Um, at the bottom of this, you can see that there's an animation timeline built directly into it, so it's not a separate asset, so you can put as many sequences inside of one single asset. And then we're kind of following the similar design patterns and styles from many of the DCCs, so you're, you can see kind of like the color wheels and the alignment tools for being able to align items. It's both a 2D and a 3D editor all at once, so you can see I'm hopping out into this uh, 3D view, and you can see the scene, for example, here from all angles, but I can bring in uh, like a blueprint, for example, for the logo that has a jetpack on the back of it and be able to utilize like the full power of the Unreal Engine. Uh, all the shapes that are built inside of there are procedural geometry, which we'll get into here in just a second as well. Um, and so right now I'm just doing a split view. You can see I can do 2D and 3D at the same time. And I'll, I'll show in just a second where we end up using the 2D interface to draw out some of the, the procedural shapes. So all of this was built inside the engine. The only thing that we imported was that the 3D logo for the, the skull shape there. So in this view, what I'm showing is we have a 2D view and you can see that we have rulers along the side that make every designer feel at home. We have uh, Photoshop style guides that you can pull out onto the screen so that you can get your screen layout exactly like as you want. We have a zoom that can zoom in in 3D space and this isn't just like zooming into the texture but this is zooming into the 3D content so you can see it stays nice and sharp and crisp. Uh, and in fact, when you zoom fully in, you get down to like a pixel level grid. So you have the ability to kind of draw onto this as a, as a canvas. Play the next show here. In this video, uh, I go into more of the procedural geometry tools. Yeah, it's playing, sorry, I messed that up. So uh, we have a toolbar here on the left-hand side. You can see that we can draw out any kind of procedural shape. And with this, uh, you can see we can control like all the bevels um, dynamically. We can change like the slants and the angles. And this is all fully using our uh, U-dynamic mesh, which is what we use for geometry script and all the stuff in the engine. We've just made that kind of into C++ style primitives that allow you to interact with this natively and not have to build your own geometry tools. You can see here, like each 3D primitive has their own set of capabilities. So in this, I'm taking that and just changing the sides and the angles um, that you want. So you also have freeform polys as well. So to get these angle shapes, I'm drawing out uh, a little bit of a kind of arrow shape and the, the part that's cool is this is still bevelable. We can change that on the fly, and then there's still control points, so we can manipulate and move the mesh however we want. Um, so really, uh, you can define any of these kinds of uh, shapes very easily inside the engine. One of the things we wanted to do and that we kind of miss from our DCC packages is the ability to put on like modifiers onto the geometry. So we've added a system where we can add modifiers and you can see we have things like outlines. This isn't just 2D, it's actually 3D, so you can extrude the mesh out. Um, we have other things in there that are actually deformers, so you can bend and taper and twist uh, with all of these, but the shape doesn't really show it well, so I'm not doing it. Um, we have the ability to do mirroring, and so uh, you can kind of just mirror the geometry here and come up with a cool shape. The part that's fun about this is that it actually welds the geo uh, really nicely for you. So you can just on the fly, you know, come up with something kind of cool and then let's, uh, in a second, you'll see that we end up replicating it. The other part that's fun is this is all procedural, so I can go back and you saw, I started with a chevron shape, but I just toggled on and off and, you know, I can play till I find the right amount of design, right? Uh, and a lot of motion graphics is this way. You're kind of playing around in there until you get the look and the feel and the mood of it uh, looking the way that you want. Uh, in this section here, I'm gonna show how we have a, a start of a cloner and effector system. We don't have the effectors yet, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and just build like a simple shape like I was showing you with some outlines and extrudes. And then um, right now we have the ability to clone geometry 
uh, in a singular like linear pattern, or we can do uh, grid arrays or radial arrays. Um, and so you'll see here when I uh, toggle the clone count up to something higher and hop into the 3D view, you can see this is all you know uh, happening live here. So you can design, and a lot of the 3D motion graphics tend to be coming up with you know some of these shapes and patterns, and then diving in with the camera and putting some nice depth of field and all that kind of stuff in there. So you can see we can control you know the spacing of the of the grid and the arrays. We can add a an offset to each instance of the clone, so it can accumulate all the um, uh, all the transforms and come up with patterns. The next step for us, and as I said, this is all active development, so you're getting a sneak peek, is to add effectors, which you would move a volume through that, and it would push these objects around procedurally. Um, and so you can see here, you know, I'm just doing funky, crazy stuff, but um, you know, I'm just taking a radial array and and duplicating this around a whole bunch and and coming up with patterns. And all these things are animatable. So um, you can go into Sequencer and keyframe those items. You can keyframe like the, uh, the bevel. You can keyframe all these things. You have to be a little careful because it is recomputing the geometry, so it's, it's more expensive than your typical process. But the nice part is you can go back to the original shape, modify the base shape, and then it updates fully live. So yeah, it's been it's been a, a lot of fun just getting in there and uh, getting access to these kinds of tools with the lighting and rendering features that we have in Unreal. It makes it very very powerful. We also have a whole host of other things that are probably very broadcast specific that are coming along. So what we want to do is to put these modifiers on top of, um, and you can kind of see in this example here. There's a whole list of modifiers that you can add in them as you want, one, one on top of the other, and build stacks, and then you can basically turn those into presets. The other part here is that we have the ability to like do live Booleans. So this is something that's kind of never really been a thing for real-time computer graphics, at least. Um, usually all this stuff is pre-rendered, but we can actually take a shape and just mask through other pieces of geometry. So the way we've set this up is you can put it on an ID number, and then you can basically tell this other one to you know, use this ID, and it will mask through any piece of geometry. Right now, it's only working on our dynamic geometry, so I'm not getting it through the logo, for example, there, but you kind of get the idea. And so it's pretty powerful to be able to do this all in one package. Usually, you're kind of doing this in two or three other places, but this is more of a unified uh, workflow uh, now. So the last thing I think I have on the geometry is we have a SVG importer. So the SVG importer will just allow you to go into you know, any of your kind of Adobe Illustrator or uh, other packages that can spit out uh, SVG, and it will create geometry. And so you can see there it's, it's going in and creating uh, all the triangles and the mesh, and we can actually extrude this out in 3D depth as well. So it brings in the materials and uh, colors from the meshes themselves. So if you have like a sports logo, it's gonna go ahead and like add those materials on there for you. We're trying to do as much as possible so you don't have to rework. But you could replace those with your own custom Chrome material and really trick this out. The other part is that uh, you can also just turn this into a sprite. So instead of doing it as geometry, you can flip over and just say, no, I need to use this as a texture. And it basically saves some resources and becomes a texture. Okay, I think we're back to this stuff. On to the next here. So on this section, I just want to talk a little bit about the world outliner. If you've used Unreal for a while, you've probably been like, ah, there's certain things that just don't work the way I want it to work. It's kind of painful to some extent. So we've added a bunch of filters so that you can filter for things just like text. And it will only display the kind of text that you want to, uh, that you see. You can do, you know, lights and cameras and all that kind of stuff to make it easier to access. Some of these broadcast scenes, believe it or not, can get to like, you know, a thousand objects in, in a single scene. So being able to manage this and nest things and group things correctly is really important. We've added a system for layering where you can just add on the colors for, you know, IDing stuff together as a layer. 
you can see here I'm just taking like the paintbrush, I'm just painting back up and adding those all onto their own layer, for example. Or if you go to the parent, change it, it swaps all the children. So it makes it, uh, you know, artist friendly is what we've been thinking on this kind of tool. Um, other things is like I'm middle mouse selecting and I'm soloing a part of the scene. So if you're from other DCCs, oftentimes you want to like use some stuff and then solo it and then just deal with, you know, only these items while you work uh, and we're making it e pretty easy to do that. You can also see like we've added these icons here uh, that allow you to get to the modifiers or get to the materials or get to the animations. So it's much more user friendly for instead of having to dig through the details panel for all these items, um, they're directly there within the world outliner. And we've also changed it so you can turn these things on and off. If it, you know, that's not the way you wanna work, you can truly customize it. So it makes it pretty, pretty easy. We're also gonna make it so that we can copy those items. So once you have one of those items applied, you can just drag click and drop it onto another item. Uh, that's coming next. You can see here like simple stuff of you just want to create a rectangle and a lot of times you want to animate on nulls rather than the actual geometry, right? So, um, you know, you can just control G, it groups it, nests it under a null object instead of being, you know, um, a group actor inside of the level outliner. So we've tried to make a bunch of those things uh, as easy as possible for the motion graphics artist. And same thing for expanding and collapsing. Last thing here is um, we've added the ability to just batch rename items. So a lot of times in, I came from sports, we do a lot of player one, player two, player three. It's, you know, it's boring stuff. I don't want to rename things. So we have a batch renamer in here that just allows you to, you know, put a change the name or do a prefix or do a suffix or do a search and replace and, and rename those items. Um, I think I'm ready for the next video after this. Sorry, there's a decent amount to get through. Um, I'll go ahead and click play. So this is a bit shorter. This is, in broadcast, a lot of times what we need to do is we need to play something to a certain point, stop the timeline, and then hit a continue, which is, you can see we have all these little lines here. And with that, basically, you know, I'll talk for a certain amount of time while someone's triggering and queuing that item for me to play. So we've added stop points and continues. We've added logic so you can jump to different points and make it easy for you to, to scale these things. Uh, same here, we have multiple timelines within the same timeline. So um, in our broadcast world, sometimes we call these directors, but you can basically go in and create sub-timelines so that we can have you know, multiple options within the same graphic, which is, is very powerful. There's also been a bunch of enhancements to, um, this is on loop, so I'll just keep talking, but it's, you can grab the whole bars of keyframes now and just move them together. So uh, we put in a system called layer bars and you can see how those keyframes are connected. So you can just scale and stretch things from one end of the bar, for example, and all of them will scale and stretch. I have enough uh, time to kind of fully make the videos, but it's, it's the nice things that just kind of speed you up as you're working that we're trying to tackle. Um, on this next one here, so we also integrated something that I talked about earlier was called remote control. And remote control is the ability to expose a property across the scene and kind of access it in one centralized place. And you do that by going to the details browser or details pane and clicking on the little eyeball. And you can see that the properties that are here, we can go ahead and manipulate and modify them. So you could give someone control over, hey, change the color of this graphic, and that's fine. But sometimes you also want to say you only have three or four options to change this to. So we need some form of logic. And one of the things we found was like the broadcast was struggling with the blueprint side of things. So we've added the ability to add these things called controllers. And a controller is just, you know, it's an integer that I'm controlling and we can put a condition on this. And that condition can then say, when you're set to zero, change it to red. When you're set to one, change it to the green there. And it's easy with kind of no code, no understanding of how to cast or do blueprints, someone can easily set up these controllable processes and actions. And so we use a lot of these in the broadcast for the very simple stuff, like, hey, I just want to change a, you know, a bunch of items and controls. 
But you can see here, it's easy for someone to go and duplicate that control and then just change it to a different color and you have a new option or new theme, right? And so this is new actually in 5.1, the logic side of things. We have a whole bunch, and again, it's looping, so I'm just gonna talk for a second. But we have a whole bunch of these uh, conditions and behaviors planned. And so we have a basic set of uh, you know, six or seven of them now, but we're gonna look to expand that you know, more and more based on the feedback everybody wants. Um, but this is definitely like a very powerful way to set up a scene and then control everything in the scene in one unified place. Uh, the next step is so, okay, once I have all these graphics, like you saw, I made several of these graphics, how do we actually play these out in a live broadcast, right? So we've, uh, we've put together something called a playlist tool. It's not the end all be all controller, but it is the start of being able to output and control these um, to different engines. So in a broadcast world, you have a bunch of headless render engines, and you need the ability to play out these graphics live on air to those engines. So you can see we have these items are basically a page in the playlist, and we have an output channel. And you can have as many output channels as you want, and you can basically preview it here locally before it ever goes on to air. And then from that, you can send it to the other output feeds on the SDI, uh, the Blackmagic, the Aja cards, uh, and that kind of thing. So right now it's pretty basic. Um, we also have in this demo that I didn't show is uh, integrated of that remote control. So you'll be able to change all those properties inside of there um, from the remote control. And so I just didn't have it set up in time for this one, but this is where the operator would kind of make the show and cue all the graphics. Uh, the next up, so on the output side, we have a, a bunch of options. We have the Aja, Blackmagic, we have NDI as well. So even, as, like I said, we know that there's 10,000 TV networks out there worldwide. Um, we know that there's millions of Twitch streamers. This makes it so anyone can design a graphics package and put it onto their you know, Twitch stream, YouTube channel, any of that, that stuff as well. We can also output to our other, just our monitor as a GPU and take it as a full screen source. Uh, and we can do some of the 2110 River Max stuff, although I have to say it hasn't been tested <laughs> at this point. It's still early days for us and this isn't necessarily um, uh, even out yet. So um, next up I just wanted to talk, so this is kind of where we're at. We're at the point where you know, we have all that work done right now there's even a lot more that I didn't get into the details. I'll talk kind of free form in a minute here, but this is what we've been able to accomplish so far. So in the 5.1, you know, we were able to kind of get all those 3D primitives, the timeline changes, some of the masking and Boolean things. Uh, there's a bunch of font improvements that, you know, as a broadcaster, you need to be able to build these things and have them stay within the bar and the shapes. Um, so we have a lot of nice kind of UX features of being able to click on it and and just drag, uh, you know, hey, stay to this size and shape. Um, we have a bunch of features in there as well for pivot placement. So if you've used Unreal for a while, did you know just changing the pivot on an actor is, a, is kind of a problem or it's hard? And so we've, we've kind of fixed up a bunch of those things during this process of being able to, you can just hit one on the numeric keypad and it will go to the lower left corner, for example. And then there's little widgets kind of uh, that you can click on buttons to assign if you want. But um, and the remote control logic system, the start of it happened in 5.1, but we're going to expand that into a more robust kind of system. So now we're headed into the 5.2. One thing we're still looking at is broadcasters need a form of what's called transition logic, and that's where you can have a graphic come onto the screen, and then you can have just some of the items change. Everything doesn't have to go off of the screen, uh, where it's just the text changes, for example, only, but the bar stays up the whole time. So we're looking at some of those elements. We are working with that whole broadcast network and partners um, to basically open up that control playlist that I showed you. So at the end of the day, Epic wants to focus on the design aspects, the in-engine tools, and there's a whole world of external control that happens. If you ever have been uh, you know, part of a broadcast world, then you know it's, it's pretty gnarly in terms of automation and machines controlling other machines and stuff like that. 
So we're gonna open that up to all the third parties. We're already working with a bunch of them to say how do you, how do you control a playlist, how do you build a playlist with Avalanche and those kinds of items. Um, more of that live data feeds, the modifier systems coming into play. Hopefully the next time we kind of can show this off, we have more of a cloner and you'll see procedural animation kind of things in there and the rigging logic. And so for the next, you know, the next year, we're targeting right now that we would hopefully be able to be in an experimental release state at 5.2, which would be um, early you know, next year in uh, Q2. So probably somewhere around March, April timeframe. So we're, we're trucking as, as fast as we can to kind of make this happen. Um, but if not, if, if it doesn't happen then, then in the, the next release in 5.3, we're looking to kind of push this out 